Phyllis, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, the floor is yours, my queen, with your with your with the, the proper African poof. We shall hand the floor over to you. <laughs> So my name is Phyllis Wanjiru Mwangi. At best, I describe myself as an entrepreneur. I run an e-commerce store based in Kenya that runs global. It's called Tandao Commerce. Done that since 2012. And above all, I'm a consultant. I'm a consultant for corporates. I train corporates on uh, productivity skills, such as customer care, team building. Also at Edge Consult, we deal with women. And then finally, I work with International Trade Center as a consultant for She Trades. Um, Phyllis, what is the one thing that you could change if you could? Wow, thank you. Can you hear me now? We can. Can you yes. hear yourself? <laughs> yes, now I, I have no feedback now. I'm sorted. So in my introduction, I talked about I have I have the advantage of being a woman in business, but also have the advantage of working with uh, policy makers and governments and private sector. So I get to have a bit of an advantage of seeing both sides. So I once attended a conference at the WTO, and this one statement caught me, came from Mukisa Kitui, Dr. Mukisa Kitui, and he said, um, it is interesting that when crossing the border from Kenya to Uganda, if it's a woman with a banana plantation on her head, she'll be harassed, she'll be told to pay this and that, and she's considered a smuggler. But a truck written X company crossing the same border is considered business. So that to me would be the one thing I would want to fix because my uh, uh, Casper and Susan, I think have talked about probably the other two that I would have spoken about, but I would want to bring in that, that um, cross border trade. So we, we're dealing with Africa trade. We have imaginary boundaries and real boundaries, but women experience them more. They experience them more intense. And uh, Susan did allude to, you know, sexual harassment, trade tariffs, non-trade tariffs, which, you know, is it involves harassment and corruption. So if I would do one thing to fix that, I would digitize that entire process. Long time ago, we used to walk into the airport and you have to go to the teller and key in for you know where you and the teller has the you know the teller has the system but now we can walk in put your bags check yourself in and have a weighing system if i could i would digitize that entire process so that the women are able to you know um, train them and they are able to to move their products along from kenya to uganda to tanzania to congo to burundi without any harassment. And I think that digitization is critical. And maybe to help with that, to support with that, I would also put in uh, what we call fulfillment centers across the countries in Africa. Fulfillment centers where if it's not a perishable good, then they can pre-send their products to that country. And then an organization from that particular country, whether it be DHL, whether it be a small player like Petty yeah. Errands, a smaller player like Petty Errands, can then ship within that country that would help the digitization and the fulfillment centers i would do that i agree i agree phyllis um you know so susan is the, you know they're working quite a quite a, a, a on quite a vast range of things you work a lot from a private sector perspective um and the, there's obviously challenges in in terms of that but what are some of these challenges that are experienced by women in trade in the private sector and can they be can they be overcome and if they can uh uh you know how easily can they be overcome so what are we looking at in terms of um in terms of those challenges and being able to overcome them in the private sector thank you thank you yavi so your statistic you talked about earlier you said uh, women make up 58 percent of africa's self-employed population so there we go massive opportunity however some of the challenges, and I'll go straight to the challenges, is very few of them are 51% business owners. They either are partners with less than 50% or they are, they are uh, functioning in a leader management role. And now the masses, as Caspar alluded, the masses of women are now working at the, you know, if it's a coffee plantation, they're picking the coffee, you know, at the lower sections. So um, that's one of the big challenges. Second one is uh, not every if we find the pool of 51% businesses that are owned by women 
fewer are working with the private sector. They prefer, you find that the business model they have selected is B2C, is business to customer. They're selling directly to the customer. It's safe, the customer pays on time. They are not necessarily engaging with private sector. The smaller is a percentage that's engaging with private sector. Why? Some of the reasons historically we know is because number one, record keeping, um, which is something that we thank God for TFO Canada and all the other projects that, that, are, that are helping women to, to do this, to, to uh, institutionalize their businesses. Uh, record keeping, for example, um, just a, any, pick any corporate, any private sector, they will require at least one year audited accounts, okay, to be able to adapt you as a, as a supplier. So yes, corporates are, and private sector are trying to, you know, um, bring in more women into, 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 to, to come in as suppliers, but they, there's a gap, there's a gap that not all, not enough women in business have audited accounts. Uh, some of them are actually most of them ask for two year audited accounts, which is very difficult to find in most of the women led organizations or women owned, not women led, women owned and women led. Okay. So then of course that speaks into financing. Uh, if you if we don't have enough record keeping, uh, then the financing becomes an issue because no bank, no financial institution will want to lend you if, we, if you cannot demonstrate at least one year of something, some solution. Some solution there could be M-Pesa or mobile money. Um, if the governments in Africa can begin to really look at mobile money and say, all these women have mobile money accounts. They have M-Pesa accounts. Now they have um, they have uh, what we call a pay bill or a buy goods, which means it's the accounts of the business. So if this could be adapted, then that would really help bring in maybe about 50% into the, the financeable mold, okay? And then um, my last point was uh, in terms of working with private sector, I just want to go a little ahead of myself just a bit that women, having worked with uh, some of the organizations and about 3,000 women in Kenya to get onto private sector, private partnerships. Um, and uh, when I say 3,000, it's we registered 3,000, but about only 20 of them managed to get into private sector. And these are the challenges that now, that now I'm showing, that I'm sharing. There's something called volume. For example, an organization, private sector decides they want to bring in more women. They make a policy statement that we want 10% of our turnover to go to women, our procure and spend to go to women. Then we come in and bring in these women and they go through all the hoops. Eventually they get certified. You know, they get, uh, they become qualified suppliers. Now the challenge is there's something we call, we go deeper, we look into what is the volume and what is the value? Volume means, okay, so you've now adapted 20 more women into your, into your uh, pool of, of suppliers and great, that is good. But then in terms of value, how much of that spend at the end of the year that was promised is eventually going to the women. And that's another level of hoops and walls and things that we have to jump, you know, hop and scotch. Uh, as women entrepreneurs, as uh, private sector organizations, we really have to begin to look into that. that yes, we can, we can say we have this pool of women, but that's the volume. It doesn't relate into money. It doesn't relate for the women. So we need to look into the value of exactly how much, what are the percentages, what, what are we talking about? What is going into the women-owned businesses? Businesses, all right? Um, so that's uh, the last thing that I would want to mention. I could say more, but I'll give it up for, for the next session. Thank you, Yavi. I hope that uh, that is well, that is clear. No, so that's, that's, all, that's all very clear. Phyllis, while we are on that topic, um, what would you say are the benefits to companies now in the private sector? Why should they, while we're talking about investment and you know it may not be fair trade, but what would be the benefits for companies? You're doing a sales pitch now. What are the benefits for companies in the private sector to invest more in women for the trade sector? So what would be the benefits to the companies? What would they get out of it if they invested in us more? 
Wow, thank you. Thanks for that, Yavi. So I think I'll go with the first, the most obvious, which is alignment to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, which if you truly are a private sector that is global, that wants to put yourself on the map as being sensitive to the way the world is moving, to uh, equality, gender equality, decent work and economic growth, uh, reduced inequalities that I've talked about, um, SDG number five, number eight, number Number 10, number 17, which is partnership, you know, for to meet goals. If you want to be a private sector that is really seen in this world to align to where the world is going, then you wanna you wanna give that opportunity to women-owned businesses. The second thing I would say is um intrinsically, if you look at the way women do business, and please note, I'm not talking about a hundred percent. You never lack an outlier, some outliers there that do business as usual, but there's um, reports of reduced corruption practices, reduced, substantially reduced corruption practices. As I said, not a hundred percent, but you feel, uh, when you look at the nature of a woman, the nature of a mother, the nature of a sister, uh, corruption is something they want to put very far away from them. Okay. So I can pitch that as a benefit that private sector will experience that we won't need to go into you know, cut this and cut that so as to get this and get that, okay? There's a Chinese proverb that says that women hold up half the sky. And another one that says, when you feed a woman, then you fed, when you give woman, you give business to a woman, then you fed the community because immediately it goes to her daughters, her sons, her spouse, it immediately it goes to work in the home. So we have better homes, better living. And then intrinsically still, I would also talk, uh, want to talk about uh, uh, private sector has, most of the private se sector we work with have uh, what they call the corporate social responsibility. And it's, it's almost like you have to decide as an organization what you want to impact and then create a foundation that does that. I want you to know private sector members that there are so many women, uh, women led, women owned organizations that naturally, I mean, naturally, give and when i say give for example let me give an example it's that they source for bids from you know the local the uh, we call them the you know the the women in the villages is that they source for bids and attach it to their apparel and sell it internationally globally if you do the mathematics on the impact of that that they are paid by this organization i'm not saying men's businesses don't do that but it's mm -hmm. almost natural for women's business to do that they're called social impact businesses if you look at them very well you're going to see very many women at the top so those are some of the advantages i could go on and on about the advantages about dealing with women but let me talk about just those four five and i uh, hope good. that we can get more organizations working with uh, women in business no, absolutely, okay. Phyllis. Okay. I I can see the passion. The passion came in right at the end. Phyllis, I know that you were you were you were burning to say something else. So here we go, my dear. <laughs> oh end wow. for us. <laughs> in 60 seconds. All right. Um, so Yavi, I just want to go back to what I'm really convinced about technology in Africa, uh, being a, a real enabler. And I really appreciate your earlier point on we have to be careful about AI. But as we're being careful, can we be the AI? Can we be the owners, the innovators? Can we be the innovators of this system? Because it's coming anyway. I mean, Uber came and courted and dated customers in Africa. And by the time taxis were up in, I'm saying, no, Uber, it was too late. We're in love with Uber. Mm. Okay, about uh, and I recognize the power of such sessions, you know, that we have ideas streaming, we have, and so back to my idea, my one idea would be, can we own this AI business? Can we own the technology that then facilitates inter-Africa border trade? Can we? I think, yes, we can. So let's go out there, women, men, let's innovate, let's change Africa, let's have the digitized systems for ourselves, by ourselves, for Africa, by Africa. Baba. Thank you. <laughs> A sister 